This is terrifying. Um, I'm usually, usually in a shed on my own making things. So apart from the spiders, this is the biggest audience I've ever had. <laughs> and I'm going to be reading from a script because it's just easier for me. Um, yeah, this is me. Um, I'm Rob. I started my career as a bricklayer working for my family before achieving a degree in design. A friend told me one of the most nerve-wracking things is standing up in front of a room full of your peers about to speak. Luckily, I'm not at that bricklaying convention. I want to talk about creativity, specifically how Blender and other open source software can be used to transform one idea into another through the process of digital transmorphism. I saved myself thousands in subscription charges and over £400 in one-time charges by shunning the corporate behemoths that entice students into an unnecessary software ecosystem only for them to be hit by large bills at the end of the courses. I learned this the hard way. I also saved about 10 grand building my own router. I'll come to that later. My presentation tends to showcase my free and open source workflow for transforming drawings and digi digitalizations from the real world, then processing the results for manufacturing on my home-built CNC router. I love making and fixing things for people. It doesn't matter if it's a walk-in wardrobe, garden building, or customized hop-up. Making is how I learn about the world around me. I think the reason why I like CNC so much is because I understand how things are made in the real world by repeated disassembly. I also think it works the other way around too. By making in 3D, you learn more about the constraints of real world physics because they're not there. I design things digitally, whether it's making router templates for clocks, using maths to create a wall hanging, my own fabric bonded resin furniture or an arch former to make a twisted arch out of real brick, I explore the world by drawing it digitally. This finally paid off when I won the English Riviera Award for one of my designs. The question is, how can you do this? The first step to making in Blender is to come up with a solid idea. Drawing is the main part of design. The word design literally means to mark out or to draw. A big part of my workflow is drawing by hand. Drawing helps my brain process the world around me and can also help to interpret to others my ideas and intentions quickly. Alongside a few reference photos, you can create anything you imagine and explain, I explain design changes effectively. Therefore, Sketchbook is my most important open source tool. If you draw, you have a good understanding of what you need to create when you're ready to open Blender. As someone who likes open source software, it was inevitable I would navigate to Linux. That finally happened when a Windows update notice told me my computer wasn't good enough. Creativity shouldn't be limited by people telling you you're not good enough or your tech not new enough. Saying that, if someone offered me a new CPU, I'm sure my productivity and happiness would skyrocket. When I press the power button on my Tower of Power, a few seconds later, I'm logged into my Debian operating system running the KDE Plasma desktop environment. KDE's range of open source applications is incredible. I highly recommend visiting the KDE's website. Coincidentally, this is the machine I wrote this very presentation on using LibreOffice. I even use it for my accounts at home. 
I settle on Debian because it's the operating system recommended by the developers of Linux CNC. Another prerequisite this field was a need for ultra stability when doing procedures that require long computational periods. I also needed a NVIDIA graphics cards CUDA course for running Meshroom. I'm not sure how on open source the NVIDIA drivers are, but from what I understand, they're a lot better than they used to be. Once the computer is switched on and I'm full of coffee, I'm ready to start making. I need to get some source images onto my computer. This is either accomplished by transferring images from my Android phone with a powerful KDE Connect, or simply by plugging in my camera's SD card into the computer. Another method is scanning. Believe it or not, it's now really simple to get an old scanner to work on Debian. I use Document Scanner. The printer side is handled by Gut and Print and Cups. If buying a new printer, it's best to check the compatibility with other software. Another method I use for getting data onto my computer is 3D scanning using a photogrammetry program, Meshroom. Meshroom uses special algorithms to, it, to map an object by plotting points from photos in 3D space. Unfortunately, the Meshroom files are massive, so I didn't keep the Meshroom version of this wing. I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of sculpting in Blender, but I love the hands-on approach of modeling in real clay. This software allows me to model in clay, then I can use Blender's sculpting tool simply to smooth out some of the areas I don't like. I also find it faster than modeling purely digitally. <sighs> After I finish creating outside Blender, it's time to load up the main event. The first thing you notice is that my Blender isn't your Blender. Mine has the default monkey. Everybody should customize Blender to find a workflow that works for them. The next thing is I run Blender from a terminal window. This gives me more information about what's going on under the hood of Blender. And for example, Blender could be performing a complex calculation. The terminal window will show me the progress rather than me thinking the program's crashed. Also, BPY Top is a great Linux-based system monitoring tool I use. Other than that, I mainly use 3D print toolbox for mesh fixing meshes and bolt factory for making bolts and nuts. <sighs> Blender Cam is capable of doing bass relief conversions at a push of a button, but I prefer tweaking the settings and doing it slightly differently. Before I use Blender Cam to generate G-code, I need a model. To do this, I can use anything in Blender's feature set to prepare it for cutting. This can include vertex edging, sculpting, importing a pre-made 3D mesh, curve editing, and even geometry nodes. But by far, my favorite method is using Blender's built-in mispass feature. The lesser known feature for modeling, but teamed with an orthographic camera, you have a fantastic tool to generate a height map to make ancient looking bass relief carvings. Best of all, the models don't need manifold edges. To turn it on, you look in view layer and under passes, then object data properties with your camera selected, you should tick the box that says missed in the viewport display. Um, in the drop-down menu. Now, in the World Properties tab, the Miss Pass section should have appeared. Here, you can tighten the area of effect. On a side note, I would love all that in one section of Blender. Um, I find it easiest to reduce my render quality at this point and hit render a few times to set up the camera. After the final render, render finishes, a drop-down menu appears that says combined. Click that and select miss to view the result. The result is where what I save and then use to generate the height map for my carvings. 
I extrude the height map in a new scene by adding images of planes, selecting this pass image as a source, then subdividing a scene amount of times and apply a displace modifier, making sure to change the coordinates of the displace modifier to UV so the UVs align. As you can see, this mass of objects is starting to look more like a carving. Blender Cam. Blender Cam is amazing. As a designer, I regard it as my number one created tool. Blender Cam processes data to create an output file written in G code. G code is a programming language that tells my CNC router what direction to travel in. To do this, I start by placing my model in the positive axis of the X and Y plane. Then I select CNC Cam from the Render Engine drop-down menu. This is where all the settings needed for a Cam operation are set. First, I add a new Cam operation, naming it appropriately. In this case, selecting Parallel from the drop-down menu in the Cam operation setup section. Here, I reduce the separation distance of the toolpaths, paying attention to the cutter engagement and is enabling skin if needed. Skin simply moves the generated path away from the model slightly, allowing for another tool to come in later and do a finer pass. Next is ticking OpenCamLib. OpenCamLib is an open source library that provides refined computer-aided manufacturing algorithms for BlenderCam. At this point, you might want to add layers and set the free movement height. Blender Cam supports different cam movement patterns. Here, I'm using Meander to save cutting time. This is located in the Cam Operation Area section. Simply, it means the router bit moves left and right whilst cutting instead of one direction and going back to the start again. Next is the cam feed rate. This sets the axis movement speed of your machine. It's very dependent on the build quality of your machine and what you're cutting and the quality you want. After that, we have the cam cutter section. That's the spinning metal thing that destroys anything it touches. <laughs> From experience, don't buy cheap, untrusted brands. I use two router bits to make the Blender logo. A common one measuring 12.7 millimeters with two cutting edges to cut out most of the shape. I then changed to a one millimeter ball cone to trace the fine detail in another operation. The ball cone is exactly what it sounds like. It's a ball shaped cutter with a cone attached to it. After that, we have sections that are very specific to your machine, including many post processors to choose from. Obviously, loving open source technology, I chose Linux CNC. Once you hit Calculate Path and Export G Code, Blender Cam will calculate the path of the simulated cutter and save the resulting file to the directory where your saved Blender file is. I'm a self-confessed Python fiddler. I don't usually program, but somehow I managed to create my very own useful tool with a lot of help from the Blender Python chat room, the old one. This little script opens up the save location of my .blend file in the system's default file browser, saving me a lot of time looking through file paths, trying to find where the G code saved itself to. When I say default file browser, that includes Windows, Mac, and Linux. I think it's so useful, I would love to see something like this as default in Blender's asset browser. Anyway, this is how I locate my generated files when adding them to a USB drive to transfer them to my CNC machine. Before I get into my CNC machine, the folks looking after the Blender cam are changing things. Due to the rapid progress of Blender development, Blender has outpaced the capacity of the small but dedicated Blender Cam team that maintains and continually adds features to the extension. 
As a result, the newly ratified code changes in Blender were incompatible, breaking the extension in release 4.2. This has hindered the software's development. The good news is the team are currently focusing on rebranding efforts to comply with Blender's extension policy. You can still access older but still recent off software by visiting the Blender Cam or GitHub web pages. These links will redirect you as needed once the rebranding and recoding are finalized. And I'm announcing good news today. Last week, the team decided on a new name for BlenderCam, and that is Fabex CNC. Now back to my machine. I love the Marvel films, so naming the giant CNC was easy for me. Or hail Galactus, the devourer of woods. <laughs> I taught myself welding so I could weld together my own machine. I learned basic electronics so I could assemble a circuitry. I designed it from scratch in Blender, starting in the UK's COVID lockdown. And I bought loads of parts from Shenzhen in China to build it. It has a capacity of 1,220 by 2,440 millimeters and over 100 millimeters deep. It uses four NEMA 34 stepper motors and moves a two horsepower spindle at over 3,000 millimeters a minute. It's controlled by an onboard computer. Blender was instrumental in designing the CNC router. Without it, I would have not been able to even begin this project. It helped me finalize the dimensions and order parts. It can do computer-aided design. I use it to prepare 3D printed parts for manufacture using yet another open source package, Cura for Linux. After I spent a year of spare time building a CNC router, I'm, I'm finally ready to insert the USB stick I was talking about earlier. I put it in the USB slot on the machine and load up Linux CNC. This software reads instructions from the Blender generated G code file and converts it into machine motion by first sending it to my MISA card over Ethernet. This then allows the computer to communicate back and forth between the stepper motor controllers and any other peripherals. Couple this with a powerful spinning blade and you have a CNC router. After the roughing pass is finished, I load up the next file, the finishing pass. I skipped a bit, because otherwise it would take too long. These series of photos were taken in about an hour. On a side note, this is tulip wood. No relation to the Dutch flower, I just thought it was kind of a good idea at the time. Um, I wanted to design something that linked the ancient past of the Netherlands and the southwest of England together. After all, our languages and culture have some great historical links, such as interesting Celtic carvings. I also wanted to create something made by me that not only showcases Blender's potential as a CAM suite, but Blender's mo modeling capability for CAM too. So keeping in with tradition, I created Tom and the rest of the Blender Institute, yet another magnet. I really think Blender will see more development in CNC manufacturing in the next few years. I imagine it being a must-have tool for the world's factories in the future. I hope you learned something listening to me. If not, I hope you... <laughs> if not, I hope you enjoyed the things I made. I'll be especially happy if you enjoyed learning about making. Thank you.